Good evening, Brody. And hi, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. I think we're ready to get started. Um, I'll pass it over to Annika to give us some opening remarks. Hi, and welcome, everyone. Um, I am not as technically savvy or prepared for uh, tonight, but I will be speaking so you'll be able to hear me. Um, but you won't see me. And thank goodness we have Esham to help us out here. So you guys will get to see him. Uh, anyways, again, welcome to our town hall tonight uh, on how the city of Hamilton can create more affordable housing on private land along with the LRT route. This event will focus on the tools of inclusionary zoning, but we will touch on other policies and opportunities for Hamilton in ending the housing crisis. My name is Anika, and tonight, along with Esham from the Hamilton Community Benefits Network, we will be the MCs for our event. Um, and I'll pass to Esham for land acknowledgement. Yeah, so we want to start off with a land acknowledgement. Um, we're grateful to be residing on the traditional lands of the Huron Wendat, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the First Credit Nation. Um, we further acknowledge that on the so-called land known as Hamilton, it was settled and covered by the between the Lakes Purchase of 1792 between the Crown and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. And it's important that we honor this truth and acknowledge the ongoing genocide of Indigenous people in Canada. So we gather today on stolen land and at the displacement of Indigenous people. Living on this territory makes us all Hamilton Treaty people. Um, and one treaty that covers this land is the dish with one spoon wampum belt, which um, essentially gives us, um, tells us to treat their land with respect to take what we need and not abuse the land. Those who come as um, settlers, immigrants of this generation or earlier generation, as well as those who are brought in voluntarily as a result of the transatlantic slave trade and imperialism are also living on this land as Hamilton Treaty peoples. So as we write here, we live in the contradictions of being treaty peoples in the midst of broken treaties and persistent inaction and idling. We commit to searching for the right words, thoughts, hearts, and actions to align ourselves with Indigenous rights and self-determination. And now we'll introduce the organizations that are part of this town hall. Okay, again, my name is Anika, uh, and I am a member of ACORN Hamilton. ACORN is a multi-issue member-based community union of low and moderate income people. We believe that social and economic justice can be the best, uh, can best be achieved by building community power for change. With 140,000 plus members in 20 plus neighborhoods, chapters across nine cities, our central purpose is to effectively represent and champion the interests of Canada's low and moderate income citizens on the critical issues of social and economic justice. Back to Ishan. My name's Ishan. Um, I'm one of the three team members of HCBN and the Hamilton Community Benefits Network is a community collective composed of representatives of various Hamilton organizations. Um, we're working to advocate for the community in developing a community benefits agreement for the upcoming Metrolinx LRT project. Um, with the massive infrastructure project underway, we want to ensure that the marginalized communities are not left with overwhelming negative repercussions. And we also have a survey that's circulating at the moment. So if you have the chance, that would um, filling out the survey would allow us to hear your thoughts and concerns on the LRT and how we can incorporate that into an agreement with Metrolinx. I'll pass it to Linda from Environment Hamilton. Thanks, Ishan. Hi, everyone. I'm Linda Lukasik with Environment Hamilton. We have a very broad mandate to help Hamiltonians enhance and protect the environment around them. And as you'll see tonight, um, th this piece, providing safe, healthy, affordable housing for everyone is an important piece. So looking forward to the conversation tonight. Thanks. OK, so. Um, back to myself. Um, why are we here? Um, that was actually um, 
a good question that I had to ask myself as well. And I did a bit of research. Um, and here we are, we are hosting this event to bring together community organizations and members to learn about the tool of inclusionary zoning and invite everyone attending tonight to join host organizations, ACORN, HCBN and Environment Hamilton in urging the city of Hamilton to pass a strong inclusionary zone zoning policy. Ishan. So what our agenda tonight is gonna look like, um, we're gonna start off with an overview of inclusionary zoning. Then we'll have um, Toronto City Councilor, Kristen Wong Tam speak. Then a speaker from Toronto Acorn, a speaker from HCBN, another speaker from Hamilton Acorn, um, Environment Hamilton, Stop Sprawl, um, and then Hamilton City Councilor Narendra Nan, and then we'll have time for questions. So we're hoping to wrap up by um, 8 p.m. Hopefully we don't go longer than that. Okay, some ground rules for Zoom tonight. We are going to be keeping people on mute to avoid background noise until it's time for questions. This meeting will be recorded and screenshots will be taken for social media. If you don't want to be in the photos, just keep your video off, but we encourage you to keep it on. Feel free to use the chat, but please keep posts related to the forum and be respectful of fellow attendees. Before I pass this to our first speaker, we want to see where everyone is joining from. With so many people, we can't do a round of names, but I'm going to call out Hamilton neighborhoods. Please wave hello when you hear your area calls. Uh, if joining from outside Hamilton, please post where you're joining from in the chat. So downtown Hamilton. East Hamilton, Stony Creek, that would be me, uh, Hamilton Mountain, Ancaster, and Dundas. Now we will hear from Carl from the Hamilton Community Benefits Network to give a brief overview of inclusionary zoning. Thank you very much. Uh, as I said, I'm Carl Anderson, I'm the Community Benefits uh, manager at the Hamilton Community Benefits Network. I'm excited to talk about inclusionary zoning uh, today. So what is inclusionary zoning? What does it mean? Well, inclusionary zoning is actually strictly a land use policy which allows municipalities like Hamilton or Toronto to dedicate um, a percentage basis for new development or redevelopment and force the developers of those projects to create and set aside a set number of affordable housing units. Now, this is sometimes done with additional heights or density bonuses, but is not necessarily re required. So what it basically says is that if you're going to be building in, in an area where the inclusionary zoning bylaw is, is applicable and can be enforced, the city can mandate that a percentage of those units be affordable housing um, and then and they have to construct those units at, <clears throat> as per the municipal bylaw as a provision of getting a building permit and being allowed to construct on the site. Uh, next slide, please. So here we're going to look at some in inclusionary zoning jurisdictions. You can see that inclusionary zoning has been used going back to 1987 in New York <clears throat> and, and, and various other major US and Canadian cities have adopted inclusionary zoning bylaws in order to help mandate what can and cannot be built. And you'll see that there's a wide range of the av available amount of things that can be considered inclusionary zoning. Every jurisdiction has a little bit different way that they deal with inclusionary zoning and they tackle it. And we're gonna talk today about the Ontario law and the possibility of bringing an inclusionary zoning bylaw to Hamilton, similar to the one that was, was created just recently in Toronto. And you're gonna to hear later on today from some from a city councillor and some allies at Acorn Toronto to talk about that experience. So if you wanna just take a quick look at this, this chart, we'll make it available. You can see that um, average market rate, AMI is used there. Some jurisdictions mandate that there has to be a, 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 an affordable housing unit at 55% of average market rates. Some of them are ownership of 100% at average market rate. So these are, they have some cities like New York have a deeply affordable option of 40% of at market rates. Um, so there are different jurisdictions that create different inclusionary zonings based on their needs, but also their regulatory conditions. Uh, next slide, please. So what I want to talk about is the limitations of inclusionary zoning as well. Inclusionary zoning isn't going isn't the 
only tool to build affordable housing that the city will have to use on the, the LRT corridor. It is a bit, it is, you can see in the little, little slice there in the light blue is kind of the target area of affordable rental housing and affordable home ownership where inclusionary zoning traditionally is used. Now, as you can see from the, from the quote there, from the city of Toronto's report, they set it at incomes between the 30th and 60th percentile. So approximate households making 32,000 to $92,000 for, per year would be the types of rent and the types of ownership that this inclusionary zoning bylaw in Toronto is targeting and will create as a course of this. So as I said, it's not going to provide deeply affordable social housing. As you can see on the chart there in the purple, um, and over there in the supportive and transitional housing, those are areas where the government really has to step up and provide the funding to do purpose-built, deeply affordable rates. We can mandate developers to build, to provide inclusionary zoning, uh, through inclusionary zoning to provide some affordable housing units, but those affordable housing units are gonna be more like du double working families uh, than they are people on ODSP or OW for this particular tool. Uh, next slide, please. So <clears throat> section 35 of the Planning Act, which was passed uh, in 2006 in a Bill 7, when the Promoting Affordable Housing Act was, was originally passed. And this was the first time that the province of Ontario set out standards by which um, an inclusionary zoning bylaw could be created by a municipality to help build additional affordable units in their communities and mandate developers to do so. Now that act was changed when the Ford government came in under the More Homes, More Choice Act of 2009 and what was called Bill 108. And that really handicapped the amount of, of area is uh, limited the amount of areas that inclusionary zoning could be applied. Um, so rather than it applying to an entire city as the original bill did in 2016, the province very much narrowed the space and, and uh, areas in which an inclusionary zoning bylaw can be applied. Next slide. So the use of inclusionary zoning is restricted to what's called a protracted major transit station area or a a development permit system area. Um, these are really fancy designations, but a protracted major transit station area is basically a six to 800 meter circle around a, a, a higher order transit line. So what's a higher order transit line? That's something like the Hamilton LRT or the coming perhaps uh, B line or perhaps the coming future uh, A line BRT. And we don't have a development permitted system currently in, in, in Hamilton uh, in use across the city uh, at this time. So what the Planning Act exempts from development are units that contain less than 10 residential units or those being built by a not not-for-profit housing provider. So inclusionary zoning laws would not be required for a sprawled development, for example, that contains single family homes. There would be no mandate. It's only for density. And it does require a series of steps that the, the, the city has to take. They have to do a, a, a study that informs and, and assesses the market feasibility of inclusionary zoning. They have to declare those protected major transit station areas. They have to set out, um, as you can see there, the minimum size of development for inclusionary zoning would require, the, the number of square feet of, a, of an inclusionary zoning, the range of types and sizes of houses that would be authorized as includable zoning, the range of incomes for which the units must be affordable, and the price and how the price and rent is determined, and the conditions under which permissions would be granted for off-site uh, inclusionary zoning dedication. Now, what off-site means is if a developer is building in the downtown core and um, there's a mandate for them to build 10% of those units as inclusionary zoning, they can opt to give the money to the city of Hamilton to build those inclusionary units somewhere else. This is sometimes used in inclusionary zoning policies uh, as a way of, of keeping um, more affordable units out of more desirous retail areas. That is to say areas where they, the developer feels that they could get a lot more bang for their buck and would rather just pay off the city to have them build those units somewhere else. Next slide, please. So where can inclusionary zoning happen in Hamilton? 
Well, the city hasn't even begun, and it's kind of why we're here to start this conversation with all of you. The city hasn't even begun to study where inclusionary zoning might apply. They have done none of the background steps required in order to bring forward an inclusionary zoning bylaw. And as of current staff reports, there are tentative plans to maybe have this conversation happen sometime in the late 2023. And that's only a plan. So there's, there's actually no timetable for this to occur, which is a little bit of, of the urgency that I'll talk about later on and why. So as I said, those protected major transit stations are a fancy way of saying five to 800 meters around a GO station. So that's the Hunter Street GO station, the West Harbor GO station, the new Confederation GO station, or a stop on a higher order transit, as I mentioned, the B line or the, the A line. So we don't know what Hamilton's uh, staff are going to study or recommend or which particular areas may be applicable to the inclusionary zoning bylaw. And if you go to the next slide, Here's a nice little map just to give you some idea. If you can just imagine an 800 meter circle around all of those little dots across the city of Hamilton. So the proposed A-line BRT, which is scheduled to possibly begin in 2026 or 2025, um, or, or as you can see, the B-line LRT that will be built or those green dots, which are the GO stations. So anywhere within those areas are areas that the government expects there to be massive building and density. So they expect around those station stops that we will see denser and denser units, eight story, 10 story, 30 story, higher, taller buildings. And of course, because of the, the, the desirability of being around a transit station, they have provided this inclusionary zoning tool to help manage some of that development. So it does net some affordable housing units. Next slide. So now I'd like to introduce our, our next guest um, and I'll pass it over to Ananka to, uh, to, to go ahead and introduce uh, the counselor. And she's gonna give us some background on what Toronto went through when they started their process of designating that inclusionary zoning bylaw. It is, it's, it's quite a lengthy process that a city has to go to in order to, in order to be able to apply to the province to pass an inclusionary zoning bylaw. Well, thank you, Carl, but um, it's actually Esham that's going to introduce uh, a counselor Wong Tam, and so I will pass it over to him now. Thank you. Um, so up next, yeah, we have Councillor Kristen Wong Tam joining us from the City of Toronto. Um, Councillor Wong Tam was elected to Toronto City Council in 2010 and has an extensive career in investing in the city through both the public and private sectors. Her contributions have led to the development and support of improved social planning programs, new affordable housing, innovative economic development programs, community art projects, and investments in diverse, family-friendly neighborhood planning. She has led efforts to defend the rights of tenants to obtain affordable and decent standards of rental housing and helped create a neighborhood association to preserve and protect heritage buildings and historical landscapes in the ward and was voted Toronto's best city councillor by Now Magazine readers five times. Over to you, Councillor Wong Tan. Thank you so much, Isham. I just, <laughs> my screen was so sensitive. I touched it and you all disappeared, but now you're back. So it's great to be here. Um, I just wanna begin by saying thank you to all of you for, for coming out to this evening's uh, panel discussion. And also just to acknowledge that I'm actually, um, uh, sort of streaming uh, with you uh, from Toronto, uh, which is the uh, lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit, uh, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, and the Haudenosaunee, uh, and the Wendat people. And Toronto, of course, is still uh, home to many Indigenous uh, diverse people, uh, including uh, treaty people of 30, uh, 13. Um, so, uh, you know, Carl, I just want to congratulate you. you. You summed up what was probably uh, one of the most complex housing policies uh, planning um, uh, regulatory uh, bodies um, frameworks in, in such a concise manner. And I thought that it was fairly accessible um, because certainly I've heard people describe um, uh, inclusionary zoning, we'll call it affectionately here as IZ, uh, in all sorts of different forms. Uh, I thought you did a fantastic job. I also recognize a number of those uh, those slides and images and, and the numbers. So I, I know that uh, uh, you, you leaned into the Toronto data uh, which is uh, which is why I'm here to share a little bit of what happened in the city of Toronto, um, and uh, and how we got our inclusionary zoning uh, bylaw uh, passed, which is now part of an official plan amendment, and uh, and uh, and it comes into force and effect uh, as of 
September the 18th, 2022, which means that every developer uh, that is going to be uh, submitting an application that meets those physical criteria that Carl was speaking about. So it has to be up to a certain size, it has to be within a location, it uh, has to um, uh, hit certain markers uh, with respect to the, um, uh, to the density. If it does all that, then IZ is triggered. So we really tussled at the city of Toronto um, over uh, the, the quantum. So, uh, and, and I think it's important for us to recognize by just taking a step back before I go into the, the quantums, uh, is that, you know, the inclusionary zoning, uh, as Carl had mentioned, is that, you know, it was a tool that was supposed to drive um, uh, the investments as well as the construction of affordable housing. I would layer on one additional um, uh, observation Inclusionary zoning was introduced to, to break through that sort of NIMBY stronghold in suburban um, uh, neighborhoods in the US where, where residents would rally against affordable housing. So they figure that if they can build it into the actual policies and, plan and the planning regime, then, you know, then those neighborhoods would have to accept it. And, uh, and Canadian cities um, are, are coming a little bit late to the, to the game. Uh, certainly uh, we are in, Ont in Ontario. Uh, Montreal's had it for some time. Um, and uh, one thing I can offer you is that, you know, if we had stayed with the original wind government program, which would have been, you know, inclusionary zoning everywhere, <laughs> like literally everywhere, um, uh, as long as it meets those criteria of physical uh, bill form and GFA, um, we would have a lot more options as, a, as opposed to being restricted to the protected major transit uh, station areas. Uh, which, which of course means that you have to have higher order transit. So just basically anything that, that's attached to rail. So already right off the bat, um, we are restricted. And so Toronto uh, began the conversation uh, literally decades ago. We've been asking the province for these powers. We never were able to get it. And uh, of course, uh, with the Liberal government, they introduced it, but then the Ford government changed it. Who knows what the next government will bring? Um, perhaps it may be changed again, uh, which means that Hamilton might get a better deal than, than Toronto would, and we'd have to go back and perhaps redraw the map one more time. Um, but let's work with the rules that we have today. One of the, the things that made Toronto's story, um, I think, pretty unique is that there was a lot of community power behind it. And, and that makes a huge amount of difference. So by way of seeing the coalition partners that have come together to bring this forum, um, keep that up. If you have all these different critical uh, civil society stakeholders pushing for IZ and even pushing city staff, um, it is going to make it happen. But uh, you can't do that without a political champion and recognize uh, Councillor Nan is here. So uh, it really takes a, a huge group effort. Um, and I would, I would just suggest that you aim big, as big as possible. So I'm going to share with you what we did, um, which was we aimed, um, a small group of us aimed big. Uh, we got outvoted and, uh, and we have what we have. So the Toronto scenario is that Sometime between 2022, that's September, I told you the start date, to 2030, we will see an implementation of IZ uh, that will bring us a range of 5% to 30, to, sorry, to 22% of affordability, uh, either affordable ownership or affordable rental. So that's 5 to 22, from 20, 2022 to 2030. A smaller group of us uh, was pushing really hard uh, for inclusionary zoning to begin at 20% to go to 30% and then to accelerate that. So therefore we don't hit our mark uh, by 2030, but rather by 2025. So much more aggressive timelines, right? Um, and, and the way we did it was we, we sort of compared it to a couple of other cities, um, Montreal being noted uh, by Carl once again, uh, that their affordability rate is sitting about 30, 35 to 40% for the, pro for the projects that qualify uh, for IZ. New York City, some deeply affordable, between 25 to 30% of their projects may include inclusionary zoning. So Toronto's numbers again, 5%, to 10% in the first year of 2022 
is relatively modest. By all standards, if by the time we get to 2030 and we hit that 2020, uh, tw sorry, 20, 22% mark, it's still relatively modest. It's on the low end of, of other cities. So we're on our high end is their low end. Um, the other thing to note is that because it's so restricted to the um, protected um, uh, major uh, transit uh, station areas, you're really limited on where those developments um, uh, can be secured. IZ can be secured in those developments. And so the less high order transit you have, um, the less opportunity to secure. So that's gonna be one, one thing that I think we need to push for into the future. Uh, if there's a way to amend the, the provincial regs, uh, that's the one thing that will certainly open it up. Um, the, the other thing for us to, to keep in mind is that um, there are a number of exemptions uh, besides you know, not meeting the criteria for, uh, uh, for the land and placement and not being attached to high order transit. And that is of course the smaller, uh, uh, the smaller buildings. So in the city of Toronto, we don't include mid rise. If there are less than, uh, for example, 100 units, uh, those uh, units would not, uh, those development would not qualify and IZ would not be triggered. Um, Interestingly enough, Toronto is probably one of the most expensive housing markets um, in, uh, uh, in Canada, uh, right up there with Vancouver. I think we actually overtook Vancouver recently. Uh, not, a, not a proud title, but certainly, certainly not. Um, but I also know that Hamilton is becoming incredibly expensive. I, I took a peek at your numbers recently and I was actually quite, quite shocked. Although I, I've been hearing about the migration and the speculation of land, but certainly those numbers would, uh, would signify that you're feeling the same type of, um, of affordability crunch as we are uh, in the city. So how do we mobilize the community members so that they can really add some jet fuel to your advocacy efforts? And please don't be discouraged that it's gonna take years because literally it took us years. And, and that's on top of the decades of asking the province for the permission and the, and the regulations to, be, to enable us to do that. So it is gonna be realistically a, a multi-year fight. So uh, of course you should be in a hurry and you should rush to the finish line as, as quickly as possible, but, but don't, be def don't, don't defeat yourself by saying that it's taken you too long. Uh, because if, uh, if you're doing this work and the LRT is coming through and you have this broad coalition of people that have come together, uh, it is certainly um, uh, a fight that I'm pretty confident that you will win uh, because that's, that's how uh, political change happens is through that type of mobilization. Um, I'm just going to leave you with a, a few stats just because I know I'm out of time. Um, but um, let, me, let me describe the situation in Toronto uh, a little bit more in detail. Um, if we had uh, inclusionary zoning uh, 10 years earlier, let's just say, for example, and you've probably heard about the stories of the cranes in the sky and the fact that we're going through this massive construction uh, you know, boom, uh, we would have over 30,000 units of, of affordable units in Toronto over, built over 10 years, as opposed to what we have built over 10 years, a decade of construction uh, is, is, a, is a meager 5,000 units. So, it would have been 25,000 more units had we had IZ 10 years ago. And, and even to that point, our housing wait list is sitting about 120,000 people uh, for, the, for the wait list for housing. Uh, and just to break it down for you further, is that if you're looking for a bachelor apartment, a studio apartment, it's gonna take you approximately, I believe seven years. If you're looking for one bedroom apartment, uh, it's gonna take you close to 10 years. If for, for an affordable unit. Like, so, so the, the, the sense of urgency is, is there because this is about real lives and it will make a huge difference when you win, um, but, uh, but it will be a, a multi-year fight. Um, and, and the one thing I am gonna be pretty confident about is that I'm pretty confident that city planners talk to one another. So our planners would talk to Hamilton's planners, Hamilton planners will talk to Ottawa planners and we're, we're always sharing. Um, there will be a lot of learnings uh, across the, uh, the different cities 
And I think that if you can uh, encourage your planners to speak to the Toronto planners to understand how they went through their exercise, because there had to be some testing of market feasibility, meaning that if, the, if, they, if they felt that the market couldn't bear the IZ numbers, then they weren't going to recommend it. So there was a huge pushback in Toronto of developer interest and land speculator interest that helped suppress our numbers at 5%. We didn't get to a starting point of 20% because the land uh, builders, uh, developer associations are very, very powerful. So you're going to have to figure out how to contend with that and deal with those same type of speculative, uh, speculative, uh, speculatory um, and predatory forces uh, in Hamilton. And that's going to be the other demon at the table that may be wearing, um, you know, may be very nice talking, talking about the need to build more housing. Uh, but I guarantee you they're not on your side. They will do everything they can to undermine your efforts and they will do everything they can to get to those friendlier counselors. If you have a friendly mayor to that type of uh, uh, message, they're gonna do everything they can to tell you and scare you that you can't be ambitious. You should not ask for more because development will dry up. And if the pipeline of development dries up, then housing and revenues and levies to the city will all go. We heard that throughout the entire consultation process. And yet we know that even if we hit our high watermark of 20 to 30%, land speculators would have received 10% over their current value um, appraisal on the land. And uh, developers would have um, pocketed a, a, a very hefty 15% uh, uh, profit. And that's, on the, and that's on our higher end. So you can imagine what they're making off with as we settle for the lower end numbers. Um, so I'm gonna leave it there and, and happy to take some questions. I'm, I think I'm out of time and uh, handing it right back to Isham. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Councillor Wong Tam, for taking the time to join us and speak. Um, before I introduce our next speaker, I wanna quickly mention that um, some folks were requesting closed captioning and we were having technical issues with closed captioning, um, but we this meeting is being recorded and we're going to caption it and upload the video later. In the meantime, if you wanna check out the Facebook Live video that does have auto-generated captions, that may be helpful. But up next, we have Abdullah from Toronto Acorn. He will be speaking about the community and public campaign pushing for a strong inclusionary zoning policy for Toronto. Thank you so much, Ishan. How's it going, everybody? Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, thank you, Councillors Nan and Wong Tam, as well as uh, all these lovely Hamilton Acorn members. Uh, I, I want to tell you about uh, the work we've been doing, sort of expand on what uh, Councillor Wong Tam uh, said about uh, Acorn's fight for inclusionary zoning in Toronto. Um, so this is some of us, you know, uh, some of the actions we've had over the years uh, to fight for inclusionary zoning. We'll see some more of these uh, beautiful faces over the next couple of slides. Uh, next slide, please. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, so between 2006 and 2014, this is uh, what we did with regards to uh, with regards to inclusionary zoning. 2006, uh, an NDP MPP. Sherry DeNovo um, introduced a private member's bill for inclusionary zoning. And in 2008, uh, Toronto Acorn, in partnership with the Wellesley Institute, Institute, put out a report by Richard Dirdla titled Inclusionary Housing in Toronto. So this is sort of where um, that sort of research, that sort of uh, effort began. And between 2009 and 2014, the NDP introduced um, inclusionary bills, inclusionary zoning bills five times. And in 2014, uh, a Liberal MPP named Peter Milkson uh, introduced a private member's bill calling for inclusionary zoning. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you very much. Again, uh, more actions. You know, As you can see, we've been out in the cold, which hasn't been the most fun, but um, really, really important work that we've done uh, over the years uh, getting, getting this stuff done. Um, you know, just standing outside of MPP's offices, um, standing outside of uh, different um, uh, housing housing offices, and, and it's been really important work that we've we've been doing. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. In 2016, Acorn organized actions across the province. You saw some of those pictures in the previous two slides. 
Uh, we've also held campaign workshops across cities where ACORN organizes, and we're hoping that uh, we can get that started in Hamilton soon. Uh, in, December, in December of 2016, uh, legislation was introduced which would give inclusionary zoning powers to municipalities rather than make it uh, provincial or federal. So, you know, uh, different cities have different um, limitations, different uh, circumstances. So, you know, this was important legislation to happen. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, between 2017 and 2018, uh, regulations from the province came out. Uh, and no surprise, in December 2017, we, are lear we learned that uh, a lot of the provincial people are pro-developer. Um, I don't think that comes as any surprise to any of you. Uh, we're all ACORN members, so we understand that that happens quite often. Um, and then in January 2018, we had a big action at the Ministry of Housing uh, by ACORN and our allies, including um, Progress Toronto, Progress TO, um, you know, highlighting issues with these regulations. Um, and you can see some of us, uh, you know, protesting there. In uh, April 2018, we had an inclusionary zoning victory. However, in June 2018, Doug Ford was elected. Uh, as we all know, not really a victory for any of us. And uh, between 2018 and 2019, um, Doug Ford enacted legislation to limit inclusionary zoning, including the Bill, Bill 108, which was the More Homes, More Choice Act, which, you know, sounds nice, but, um, you know, not, not as, not as, positive as it might sound. Uh, regardless, we were out there campaigning, uh, fighting for, uh, for um, you know, inclusionary zoning wins. Next slide, please, thank you. Uh, in 2019, uh, the city of Toronto hired um, consultants to study the impact of inclusionary zoning. Uh, the NVLC has received awards from de developer groups, such as the Building Industry and Land Development Association. Uh, AKA builds. So again, not a pro, uh, not a pro tenants um, organization. And the study, unsurprisingly, was very pro developer. Included a requirement that um, developers maintain a fifteen percent profit margin. If you know what homes and you know developments are selling for in the city, fifteen percent is a massive amount of money, and uh, they're making this money despite a lot of us not being able to afford places to live in the city and across the province, in fact. Um, yeah, as you can see, 15% um, profit margin uh, for the ownership tenure. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Continuing in uh, 2019, uh, May 2019, ACORN released an inclusionary zoning best practices report. Uh, you can find that on ACORN's website. Uh, I can also put it in the chat after this. So you can look at it. Um, in May 2019 was May 2019 was also the month with the More Homes, More Choices Act. Um, and again, I'm still out there fighting for it. The city draft proposal in 2019 was, um, you know, you can have a look at it here, but essentially, um, you know, slightly more ambitious, but not really um, as, as much as we'd like to see. Uh, again, policy directions that, um, you know, we, we wanted more more aggressiveness on. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and between 2020 and now, uh, city consultations wrapped up in November 2020, and there were there was a second round uh, of uh, public consultations which you see on the screen here. Um, you know, just before uh, the pandemic started, and we sort of got a better understanding that. Um, there are really big problems uh, in this city when it comes to affordability. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so this was the 2020 draft proposal. And, um, you know, as we gained a better understanding of what was affordable, what, what was considered affordable, what was feasible for the city to, to make happen, um, we, you know, this was the draft official plan and zoning amendments. Uh, the affordability period, period uh, being 99 years pertains to, um, you know, us wanting to make it more or less permanent, right? Uh, we want to make it so that it's, uh, this, this is stuff that isn't just in place for the next five or 10 years. We, we want our children to be able to live in the cities that we grew up in. So um, this is really important work um, that we hope to 
be more aggressive on. Uh, and I can show you some of that as we go along. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, this was an action that we had in Scarborough. I believe this was last year, if I'm not mistaken. I remember this happening. Um, again, uh, yeah, another, another action in East York. We had actions downtown. We had actions at City Hall, um, you know, just trying to push as much as we can. Um, and then this report, I remember coming out uh, last summer, and I remember very clearly because we were out uh, petitioning uh, for um, for city councilor to councilors to make it so that uh, we would have more affordable housing and inclusionary zoning in, in the city of Toronto. Um, very hot day, but uh, lots of signatures that day. We're very happy with our efforts. Um, you can also look at take a look at this. Um, this report on the ACORN website. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and then another release was report, uh, another report was released um, showing who controls Toronto. And it sort of, sort of showed um, how a lot of people in important uh, powers, uh, positions of power were receiving money from developers, uh, which is, uh, obviously unacceptable as we know, but, um, you know, I, I guess they have their reasons. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, moneyed interests, as we all know, often went out uh, when it comes to pol politics. So um, this is something we're also hoping to uh, change uh, over the next over the next little while. Next slide, please. And finally, yeah, we had uh, two final rallies at City Hall last year, um, October 26th and November 9th, uh, just trying to make sure that the city knows uh, that we are paying attention, that we care about these issues and uh, they, that they affect all of us. Um, it's really good to see such a good turnout uh, those two days. Next slide, please. Thank you. So the ACORN members' demands for inclusionary zoning, uh, and I think um, uh, Councillor Wong Tam talked about a little bit of these, um, but, uh, and, and these were based on a sort of uh, a report that this, the, a study that the city con conducted themselves that showed that these things were feasible. Uh, we were at the moment, at the time we were at three to 10% of all new rental units had to be considered deeply affordable we wanted to push for a minimum of 20 to 30 percent of every development with 60 units or more um, set aside as permanent you saw that 99 years figure uh, we wanted to consider deeply affordable and not just deeply affordable for those people who are doing extremely well uh, living affluently um, we want to we want to have uh, deeply affordable units for people who are making 10 to thirty thousand dollars a year because we think that frontline workers who you know are, are frankly vastly underpaid deserve to also um, live in good homes, uh, good safe homes. And uh, we want that for all, for, for 20 to 30% at least of all new rental units uh, in the city. Uh, next slide, please. And we see the results here. Um, this was what came out of it. Uh, I think Council, Councilor Wong Tam once again um, talked about this. Uh, so between September 18th and 20, uh, between September 18th of this year, to December 31st of 2024. This is what we're hoping will happen. Um, there are three inclusionary zoning areas and they all have different um, different standards that they have to meet. Again, um, not as aggressive as we would have liked, which is why we need to keep fighting. And uh, this is why we're really excited to see uh, the city of Ham uh, Hamilton Acorns push, push for inclusionary zoning. Next slide, please. And so, you know, we talked about what, oh, sorry, if you could please go back, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. So, you know, we have goals that we're hoping to hit by 2024. We were hoping that the goals that you see in front of you would be the ones that we were aiming for for 2024. Um, and instead, you know, it's a little bit of dragging the feet happening from the city of Toronto um, and, uh, you know, we know how when something is set for eight years from now, those things might change and they might get pulled back so that that 22% goes down to 18% or 20%. And so this is why we want to anchor high. We want, we want to say 
we can reach up to 30%. So why are we going for 22 eight years before it even happened? So I think it's really important. Uh, what one lesson we've learned is that we need to anchor high. We need to ask for more than we want because um, you know they'll, they'll always take something off that um, and negotiations just just happen that way. So um, we are concerned that you know that 22% will go down in the next eight years, which is why we're pushing for more uh, going forward. Next slide, please. Yeah, so this is the uh, the phase in. This is sort of what's happening behind the scenes when we look at those uh, two slides, uh, those previous two slides that showed uh, what we have uh, happening. So as you can see, we're ramping up, um, you know, every year. But um, I mean, I'm just wondering how much room there's going to be to build new affordable housing in 2030, frankly. Um, you know, uh, we are very quickly running out of just land area in the city. Um, and, you know, uh, in 2030, when 22% of all new rental units have to be considered deeply affordable, um, you can you can understand, uh, you, you can sort of imagine what uh, developers um, incentives are to continue building. So, you know, knowing this developers will try to build as much as they can uh, in the next, you know, two to four years uh, where they can really milk it. Um, it's really unfortunate. So this, again, why we need to keep pushing for more. Uh, next slide, please. I think we're near the end of it, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, um, then affordable rents. Again, uh, we are looking at people who um, have a very different definition from what we consider affordable. Uh, I live in a studio apartment in Toronto. I pay right around that current definition. And I can tell you that it's not very affordable. Um, so I think we need to redefine what is considered affordable. I think we need to redefine who we're, who we're thinking of when we think about affordability, um, especially when you look at this, uh, when you look at this two bedroom amount, um, you know, I, I think that's a ridiculous amount when you're thinking about a two bedroom apartment where you're raising children. Um, so that's not really something that, um, you know, a potentially one a, a single income family can afford. So um, we really need to work on changing this. Uh, next slide, please. And so you can see again, uh, you know, we are pushing for the things that we're pushing for even then are, are, are quite, uh, quite egregious. I, I mean, when you consider that a studio would cost uh, $150,000 to buy, uh, even under our target income definition, um, that's, that's a lot of, that's a lot of money. Um, I don't think you should have to spend, you know, uh, four or five times your, your yearly income to, to purchase a home. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's self-evident. I don't think I have to explain any further what's going on here. Um, and so let's look at what's next. Um, there is supposed to be a 90 days. Uh, so there's supposed to be a review uh, to approve um, potentially this month. We are talking to Councillor Mike Layton about this. I don't know if uh, Councillor Wong Tam can potentially weigh in. I, I don't know if She's a because she, she, uh, I, I know that it's still sort of up in the air, and um, we we may or may not have that review happen this this month, but we're hoping that it does. Um, and then, yeah, the, the next the next two steps are reviews of market areas and uh, later this year, and uh, a review of IZ policy in twenty twenty three, and that's really what we're aiming for when we when when I talked about um, fixing it for 2024 and, and making changes so that those percentages are brought up to not 2030, but maybe 2024, 2025, um, then that's, that's what we're talking about. And that's sort of our um, longer term goal when it comes to uh, pushing for policy in 2023. So we are hoping that um, we, can, we can sort of rein in those um, those changes and, and make it so that uh, the city is more affordable, not just for, you know, the 1% or the 10%, but for, but for everybody in the city. And uh, I think that is it, if I'm not mistaken. Um, thank you so much for listening. And, um, you know, I, I hope to 
continue to be an advocate and and um, an ally as uh, Hamilton Acorn begins this journey. Um, thank you so much for being here and thanks for listening. Thank you for joining us and speaking, Abdullah. We appreciate it. I'm gonna pass it on to Anika to introduce your next speaker. Okay, and I will be re-inviting Carl to, from HCBN to speak to us again on inclusionary zoning. So we're handing it over to you, Carl. I, I love the picture you picked, thank you. Uh, appreciate it. So um, why we're here, and I really want to talk about this. Um, uh, 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 Councillor Wong Tang uh, mentioned that this is a long process, that it doesn't happen overnight. And as many of you know, this city is becoming increasingly unaffordable with the third hottest property market in, North, in, <coughs> in Canada right now, one of the hottest in North America. We are seeing an inflationary pressure on rents and displacement happening all over the city, not just along the LRT corridor, but as of right now, and subject to perhaps changed by a future government, inclusionary zoning can only happen on the LRT corridor and around the ghost stations. So what does that mean for, for, for the city of Hamilton? Uh, for some of you uh, may recall back in 2016 when we were debating the downtown secondary plan and um, uh, some activists may be on this when the downtown Uh, and of course, it hasn't. Uh, I'm just going to turn my video off. Sorry. Yeah, it it hasn't um, it hasn't done anything on that file since the downtown secondary plan was passed back in 2016. But I just wanted to give you some some uh, some numbers. If we had decided to pass an inclusionary zoning or at least started the process back in 2016. Um, and then and moved it forward and, and had an inclusionary zoning bylaw on the books by the, the, the 2020, by, um, we would be looking at having 12,000 units that were developed in that time that or, or are in, being constructed right now or in the planning phases. And that's just in the uh, Ward 1 and Ward 2. If we had looked at a modest 10% of those units being targeted for affordable housing or affordable ownership that would put 1200 additional affordable housing units on the on the market right now freeing up other rental spaces and and allowing uh, and bringing down some of that that pressure on our social housing stock uh, for for those long wait lists that were mentioned as i'm sure many of you are aware we have a, a an immense wait list for social housing here as well. Um, I believe it's at last count was about 6,500 people on the affordable housing list. Um, so the, the, the need is, is dire. And uh, the fact that the city is, is not even going to begin the long consulting process until 23 should be a concern for everyone on this call. I'll tell you why. Now that the LRT has been approved, the memorandum of understanding has been 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 signed and the project is is going forward with construction in 2023 all of the area along the lrt corridor is going to see massive influx of developer capital people are going to start buying up strip malls and underutilized land most of the lrt corridor is already zoned for 12 stories out of the gate with some accommodation for higher uh, stories at station stops themselves. So developers are going to be looking at this as their, their next front in terms of, 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 procuring, um, of procuring land, of holding on to the land, because as the LRT gets closer and closer to completion, the land values along the corridor are going to go up and up and up. And so we will lose all of those building permits and all of those buildings that are started before we pass an inclusionary zoning bylaw. And that would be mean it could that number that I said of the 1200 that we lost if we had started this process in 2020 will mean, um, of course, that we we uh, we will have additional units that will be lost that will be under development before we pass our law. If we start researching it in, in 2023, and it takes about a year for staff and the consulting reports and the public consultations, um, we won't be looking at even having a, a, a bylaw on the books until late 2024, possibly 2025. During that period, um, we will see increased displacement along the LRT corridor 
where we're going to see increased pressure as as smaller low density or, or, or smaller apartment buildings like two and three stories are purchased along the line by developers with an eye to either knock them down or to re reconfigure them for increased density. So it's very urgent that we start having this inclusionary zoning conversation as soon as possible and get it, and get it right and learn from other communities like Toronto and, and from, from our allies like in Acorn Toronto around making sure that when we shape the bylaw that it does a lot to address the deep affordable housing crisis that we have in, in, in the city. So I really just want to underline, underscore a couple of things. There's an urgency that this needs to be done. And second, that it is not the only, it's not like if we pass an inclusionary zoning bylaw, the conversation on affordable housing ends in Hamilton. It doesn't by any means. An inclusionary zoning bylaw is really only going to affect a subset, as I mentioned, the way it's written of market affordable housing. So we really need people like Metrolinx and the city of Hamilton and the federal and provincial governments to step up to provide access to Metrolinx owned land for deeply affordable housing to be built on the corridor. What we what we risk doing is what tends to happen in, in communities when a new transit line is, is invested. There's a massive rejuvenation of, of that area. Capital flows into that area. Private developers rush in. Businesses get snapped up. You can probably see little hints of that change along the LRT corridor already, but it is going to come massively now that the project is, is underway. And that affordable pro pro housing crisis that we have now will look much, much, much worse by 2025. So we really need to have these broad conversations. And this is one of a series I we hope to work with on ACORN to talk about affordable housing in the LRT corridor, because as I said, inclusionary zoning is only one piece of the puzzle. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carl, for all that information. And you know what? I'm just grateful. I'm learning so much. Um, anyways, I will um, pass this on to Shannon McKnight from Acorns East Hamilton chapter, and she will speak about what the housing crisis looks like on the ground for tenants and Acorns Homes for All campaigns. Hi, everybody. Can everybody hear me properly? You good? Okay. I usually have microphone issues. Uh, my name is Shannon and I'm a member of ACORN's East Hamilton chapter. I will be speaking today about ACORN's Homes for All campaign. Like many Ontario cities, Hamilton is in a housing crisis and we need all levels of government to play a role in finding solutions. Low and moderate income tenants across Hamilton are facing increasing displacement pressures, are forced to stay in substandard housing because they cannot afford to move, face a long wait of adding their name to the wait list for social housing or when no other options are available. Face and face becoming homeless until the city can offer an affordable unit. The center, oh gosh, sorry, lost my, the situation is dire and more and more, more must be done, especially to, municipally to address the crisis. We need to keep tenants housed that currently have affordable housing, and we urgently need the city of Hamilton to build more of it. Since 2017, ACORN has been fighting for healthy homes and tenant protections from displacement. Last year, our members organized over the summer to launch demands to fight for more affordable housing. Our full municipal housing platform includes demands for creating more affordable housing on public and private land and protections for for tenants from displacement and neglectful landlords. One, a strong inclusionary zoning bylaw to ensure affordable housing is built near high density transit areas. Two, municipal policies and programs that prioritize real affordable housing on public land. Three, a citywide landlord licensing program to protect tenants from rent eviction and substandard housing based on policy from New, New Westminster, BC and Rent Safe from Toronto. Four, a citywide rental replacement policy that includes allowing tenants displaced by demoviction returning to their units at the same rent in the new development. We released our Homes for All platform with a march along the LRT route from Queen Street to, Queen Street to City Hall and stopped at developments currently being built to show the missed opportunities already from not having an inclusionary zoning policy. Inclusionary zoning is an important, important 
opportunity to get affordable housing built by leveraging the huge amount of investment expected to continue along the LRT route and near GO transit stations. We need to ensure that transit projects benefit the community. ACORN members want to see developers' profits cut into and affordable housing delivered. ACORN Hamilton is calling on the city of Hamilton to create a bold inclusionary zoning policy that includes a set aside rate of minimum 40% affordable housing in all new condo and apartment developments where IZ can be used. Affordable units built with IZ policies be kept affordable forever. Require targets for accessible housing. Target incomes of 30,000 or less for affordability. We need affordable housing for Hamiltonians. ODSP, OW recipients, low wage workers and fixed income seniors. IZ policy applies to the minimum amount of units as set out in the provincial policy, 10 units or more. The struggle for an affordable city won't end with any one specific policy or tool, but the powers are there for the city of Hamilton to implement bold local legislation to protect tenants and create more real affordable housing. Tenants across the LRT route have already been seeing for years that buildings are being bought and tenants are being run evicted. Affordable rentals are being destroyed. We need homes over profit. We need an affordable city. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon, for sharing that with us. Um, now I will pass you on to Esham, who's going to uh, introduce Environment Hamilton. Yes, yeah, so from Environment Hamilton, we have Linda Lukasik talking about the connection between inclusionary zoning and building a climate resilient, inclusive city. Thanks, Tishan. Hi, everyone. I'm going to be really quick here. So, um, so I just want to say I'm really pleased to be participating in this event tonight. This issue is so critically important. Safe, healthy housing is a human right. And at Environment Hamilton, we're really fueled by the desire to build a climate resilient, inclusive Hamilton. So ensuring that there is safe, healthy, affordable housing along the new LRT route is something that in our minds is critical to realizing that vision for our city. So we've been working closely with organizations like the Hamilton Community Benefits Network and Hamilton Acorn and through the Just Recovery Hamilton Coalition to advocate for the changes that will make this vision reality. And I think we're all learning that there's power in numbers. And I'm thinking about Councillor Wong Tan and her advice. And, and I think coming together, we strengthen our voices and we can make a, di a difference. So inclusionary zoning, as you've heard, is a planning tool that can help to bring more affordable housing options as a community works to really intensify around those major transit station areas. We need to build that transit-oriented development in Hamilton that is really designed to ensure that everyone, especially those who depend on public transit, is that, the, that people are able to live co close to key transit lines like our LRT. So this is really a mobility justice issue. We are gonna need active government interventions to ensure that we do not see gentrification along the East-West LRT route. And I would add that we also need to ensure that this new housing that is being built is climate resilient, low carbon. We need to ensure we'll, we are building a city that's ready to cope with the challenges that the climate emergency will bring extreme heat, extreme cold, and whatever comes in between. And so that means building green to things like passive house standards. And so we can ensure that everyone, especially those most vulnerable in our city is provided with safe shelter. So we have a lot of work to do to advocate for these outcomes, um, but we need to continue to push. There are exciting opportunities emerging along the LRT line. Um, including the latest, and I want to share this one, it's in my own neighborhood, the redevelopment of the Eastgate Square site, and we need to come together to get it right at locations like that, and inclusionary zoning is one key piece, and there are certainly a whole lot of other tools that we need to advocate for too, if we want to realize that climate resilient, inclusive future for our city. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, Linda. Next up from Stop Sprawl Hamilton, we have Lily Noble um, on the connection between stopping urban sprawl and building affordable housing.
Hi, everyone. Um, glad to be here and glad that there are so many people who've joined us today. So as a member of Stop Sprawl Hamilton, our goal was to stop the expansion of the urban boundary. Um, but we quickly saw a push by developers to spread the myth that building homes out in sprawling subdivisions on farmland would increase housing affordability. In reality, new subdivisions, uh, in new subdivisions, developers mostly build single family homes, which are expensive and include higher transportation costs because usually you have to buy a car or two. Cities also end up being not able to afford all those extra uh, expanded infrastructures that they've had to build out there. And it becomes deeply expensive to all residents to cover those costs. And also remember, there's no exclusionary zoning possibilities out on farmland. It's just around higher order transit. So in our minds, um, the solution was to hold the urban boundary firm and build a variety of middle density homes within the city, provide great transit, invest in the current city limits and save farmland. And I can't emphasize enough that we have a housing supply issue and not a uh, land supply issue. Next slide, please. Uh, and I'd also like to explain exclusionary zoning, which is not to be confused with inclusionary zoning, which we've been talking about today. Uh, but exclusionary zoning bylaws are in effect right now, and they affect housing affordability. So currently, exclusionary zoning bylaws say that when you're tearing down an, a smaller home, an older home, um, that you can only build another single family home in most neighborhoods of Hamilton. So the, right, the result has been over many decades, the replacement of older bungalows with expensive McMansions. But the city is now in the beginning stages of changing that zoning to allow the construction of semi-detached homes, townhouses, and the three and four plexes, um, where previously only the McMansions were allowed to be built. These zoning changes will put an end to exclusionary zoning and is just one small step toward the creation of more affordable types of housing in Hamilton. And these will be in about 70% of the land mass of Hamilton. So it's significant um, where this can occur. Um, a new group has formed in Hamilton called More Neighbors Hamont with the goal of helping people understand that we need to end that exclusionary zoning so that we can build more affordable middle density homes in existing neighborhoods with lots of amenities where people want to live. And you can find them on um, Facebook and on Twitter. Um, there's also a, a very active group in Toronto called More Neighbors Toronto. Follow them too, they're really great. And um, let's build more homes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lily. Um, I'll pass it back to Anika to introduce our last speaker. Okay, um, lastly, we have Ward 3 Hamilton City Councillor Narinder Nan joining us. Narinder is proud to serve as Ward 3 City Councillor. She has wasted no time in her first term. She has led the call for climate emergency and supported the efforts for council to stop urban boundary expansion. She has determined the equity and the inclusion lenses to be integrated into every aspect of city's business. Councillor Nan has also been a champion for dignified and truly affordable housing by advancing major policy shifts in Hamilton, including a vacant home tax and the development of an anti reneviction bylaw regime. Ultimately, Councillor Nan is committed to fostering a sustainable city of belonging to where residents' input shapes how future generations of Hamiltonians will thrive here together. Councillor Nan. Thank you, Annika, for that introduction, and uh, thank you so much to all the organizers for putting on this uh, very important event. Uh, it's the good work of community education that will lead to good action, that will lead to good futures. Thank you to Councillor Wong Tam for sharing your Toronto Council experience and for your insights and encouragement. Uh, you mentioned the importance of having political champions. And on that note, I also want to acknowledge that Councillor Wilson from Ward 1 here in Hamilton is also in attendance tonight. To Toronto ACORN, thank you so much for that historical review of where IZ housing policy began in terms of the fight. I think it is so important for us to have that full context and that gentle reminder that uh, there is a legacy of work that we can build on here locally. And uh, thank you so much for being here to 
continuously not only support us, but also share uh, recommendations of what else to push for. Carl and the Hamilton Community Benefits Network, your thorough breakdown of what's needed and what's possible, but also thank you for underscoring the urgency of stepping up to, the de to deliver deeply affordable housing along the LRT corridor here. Shannon, for sharing your lived experience as well as that of tenants across the city in terms of the housing crisis we face and the need for tangible solutions and clear demands for what an IZ policy ought to be focusing on here in Hamilton. To Linda and Environment Hamilton for always pushing for what is possible from a climate lens and uh, emphasizing the need for em uh, passive house designs to be integrated into the criteria for IZ uh, qualifications. And Lily from Stop the Sprawl for connecting the urban boundary freeze and pushing for getting rid of exclusionary zoning in order to allow for a deeper mix of density and housing across the city. So folks, I just wanna share a few words and insights from my own listening and learning from tonight's conversation, but also from the, the discussions we've been having kind of behind the scenes. And what I love about tonight's event is it's the opportunity for us to break into much more public conversations and push this community dialogue out into all of Hamilton so that the community can engage in what is possible and demand what is possible from its Hamilton City Council. Building and maintaining affordable housing along good transit are only two key aspects of establishing complete neighborhoods. And we're facing a housing affordability crisis now that's been spanning across the city and across every city in this country and also globally. Every municipality, I believe, has a clear objective and clear requirements right now as we face this together. And that is to develop outcome-based policy frameworks that deliver climate responsive, inclusive, and true range of affordable housing. The urgency, as Carl pointed, is that Hamilton has a 6,647 household wait list trying to access social and affordable housing. And that doesn't even include everybody. That's only the folks that are on the wait list. Our shelters continue to be over capacity, including women and family particularly. And my office continues to write letters on a weekly basis. And in fact, we're down to one, we're, we're sorry, up to one letter a day on behalf of Ward 3 residents appealing to landlords to pause evictions. Properties along the LRT corridor here in Ward 3 are already being snatched up by speculators and developers, and the values continue to rise exponentially. So what does this mean? It means that it requires us as a municipality to identify every possible lever that is available to the city to connect good transit with dignified, affordable housing, and do so with intentional planning that designs communities that are complete. So what are those levers? To create good affordable housing and also to protect the housing that's here. I think first and foremost, mentioned earlier by Shannon, is the city must preserve the existing housing stock by ensuring that their good homes are not lost and more importantly, people are not being displaced. And so that anti-rent eviction bylaw that Hamilton Acorn pushed council to consider is on its way and I look forward to receiving the first report from the consul consultant later this year. We've frozen the urban boundary, but that definitely means that we need to address the issue from a zoning perspective as Lily mentioned. Inclusionary zoning needs bold definitions in terms of defining what does affordable mean? What are the requirements that the city of Hamilton wants to place on condo developments as well as rental developments along that line? You know, to, to leave it to private developers to develop, develop <laughs> deliver affordable housing mm, can leave many of us feeling quite anxious and uneasy. Uh, so it is so very important that we begin the dialogue now in starting to define what that inclusionary zoning must deliver. And the other aspect that I think we can we can start seriously uh, addressing and need to do so with urgency is look at what does a public and city owned land strategy look like along the LRT line. 
So if examples like in Ward 3, where land is already being snatched up by developers, it is that much more important for the city to identify what is the municipally owned land along the, the corridor, what is other publicly owned land along the corridor, including Hamilton Wentworth District School Board, and identify uh, what we will be able to do, which that the market is completely unwilling to do. So using our land strategically to acquire and amass land so that we can support social and deeply affordable housing developments with our social housing providers here in Hamilton and the Hamilton is Home Coalition. I believe that funding this is possible through the revenues that we could draw from hopefully our ability to put in place a vacant homes tax uh, from revenue generated from the Airbnb licensing or tax regime that's on its way as well as leveraging investments from the province and CMHC so that we can actually help them deliver on the outcomes that those investment portfolios are supposed to deliver, which is deeply affordable and not just market housing. And then I think it asks, it, you know, this, this, this entire conversation begs the question of what role can nonprofit organizations and our housing service providers play? If leaving this, if inclusionary zoning means that we're leaving the development of affordable housing in the hands of private developers, then how can we shepherd the partnerships that are required with our social housing partners like the Hamilton is Home Coalition in order to ensure that those 40% units uh, that, that are in perpetuity and at an appropriately affordable rate uh, also come with the wraparound supports that uh, individuals also need. And I think lastly, key in this entire discussion is, yes, it's about homes, but it's also about complete communities. And the piece that we need to also consider is how do we also leverage the LRT corridor to make sure that it is delivering green spaces that are publicly accessible, that we are seeing an increase in community service spaces, that we are seeing recreational needs for those affordable housing units, as well as that mixed housing along that corridor um, is serving the future needs of future populations that will be popping up along those transit oriented dense uh, spaces. So I'm going to pause there. As you can tell, uh, it's a multi-generational family moment right here, right now. Grandma's at the door. My daughter's here on my lap. And uh, I just want to say again, thank you so much. Uh, I really look forward to continuing this conversation with you all publicly. And uh, thank you again to everybody for organizing it. Thank you so much, Councillor Nan, for joining us uh, and for having your family join us as well. I think it's very important that um, this is a representation of Hamilton and how wonderful to have that image of you with your family. Uh, now I'm going to pass it on to um, uh, HCBN um, so that we can start our questioning. So thank you to all our speakers. That's the last of our, um, last of our speakers. So now we have time for some questions. If you have any questions, please post it in the chat or raise your hand using the Zoom feature. If you're following the live stream on one of our social medias, you can post your question into the live stream. Those are being monitored as well. Um, we'll try to get as many people as possible, but with a limited time. Um, if we don't hear from you, we will write down your name and follow up with you after the event. Also with a limited time, if you are speaking, please try to stick to just asking the questions so we can get to as many people as possible. So we have a, um, a question from Charlie. What role could a community land trust play? I can take that one. Um, uh, great question, question Charlie. Um, <laughs> thank you for that, based on the Hamilton Community Land Trust. Um, land trusts are, are a very interesting phenomenon. They're not for profits. And what they do is, is their idea is to take land out of the market in perpetuity. So there's uh, an example of, of a, a land trust uh, single family home that was built by Habitat for Humanity and the previous Ward 3 councillor, uh, now MP Green, donated some land to the Hamilton Community Land Trust. And, that, and the, the Hamilton Community Land Trust then approached Habitat for Humanity, who built a uh, 
who built a home on that. But as a course of, of, of land trust, what they do is they take ownership of the land and then they lease it out uh, for no profits uh, to, the, to the person. So that house is that Habitat for Humanity built will exist in perpetuity for as long as the community land trust does as a community asset and as a not for as as an affordable housing piece. So community land trust can play an interesting part um, in, in banking land and putting it aside in working with not for profit housing providers, co-op providers, in making sure that that land in, you know, when we're talking about affordable housing, for example, of your eights, there's only a criteria that those affordable or affordable ownerships exist for 20 years. Whereas if, it, if the land was owned by a community land trust, they could mandate that that land be held in perpetuity for affordable housing. So there's also obviously a role to play for, for, for land trusts in, in acquiring community lands along with governments and not-for-profits. Um, so I think we have a question from Lily. Um, I elect is compiling questions for candidates running for councillors and mayor to answer. Have you asked them to include a question about inclusionary zoning so we can get a new council that will get this done faster? Uh, that's that's not something that we've done, but it's certainly not a not a bad not a bad idea. Um, most certainly, and we can we can certainly look at 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 that and approaching them. I know um, from Environment Hamilton and and HCBN and Acorn's perspective, we will be working with our Just Recovery partners to put out a series of questions about potential future candidates for city council and how and how they will create a more just. COVID recovery uh, during their role as city councillors, and we'll be putting those questions out to all of the all of the uh, the prospective councillors who will be running in October. Next up, there's a question from Kate. Um, can IZ include units with multiple bedrooms? They're concerned that families will be squeezed out of high and middle density buildings, as investors prefer bachelor and single bedroom units. So the short answer is yes, an inclusionary zoning bylaw can mandate certain types of, of bedrooms and, and um, uh, in, in the developments. Another tool that, that city uh, staff can do is that they can, um, with an area, for example, along the LRT corridor, most of the land there is zoned for about 12 stories. Um, now, what the, the developer could do, though, is they could uh, uh, pitch to the city of Hamilton for an increase in the height of the number of stories in that building in exchange for which the city of Hamilton would extract concessions from them, uh, demands from those developers. And those, those demands could include things like um, multifamily units in, in, in the unit, extra affordable housing units, apartments partnership with a not-for-profit to build a couple of the floors of the units. So uh, inclusionary zoning is one tool, yes, but there's other tools in the Planning Act that municipalities can use. Um, oh, uh, Narinder also wanted to mention the uh, family-friendly housing policy that's uh, research that's currently underway by the city uh, and add this important point for inclusionary zoning uh, multi-room units. So we have a couple hands up. Um, I'll get to Michael first, then Elizabeth. All right, go ahead, Michael. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you everybody for the presentation. Um, I believe when Carl did his presentation about inclusionary zoning, he mentioned that uh, when uh, developers do not want to include inclusionary zoning, if I'm not mistaken, in their in the development, that that they can basically give money to the city, uh, essentially buying, you know, not 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 in exchange for not developing those inclusionary zoning. Yeah, so I, I can clarify that a little bit. So it is with it is possible for the city of Hamilton when it writes its inclusionary zoning bylaw to just take cash, what they call cash in lieu. So that is to say just a cash payment from a developer for the cost of those units. So the developer doesn't have to build them in that tower. It's done in some jurisdictions like um, New York City. It's certainly not something that I would recommend because it doesn't give you a, a diversity of, of, of different residents in a community and can actually push people out of desirable neighborhoods. Um, so it's certainly not a policy that I, I recommend that Hamilton uh, follow, but it is a policy that, that is possible and cash in, in lieu payments from developers are something that other inclusionary zoning cities have done. So, so just, just to wanna to add to that, um, I, a, 
by from what I'm hearing, how the it's such an uphill climb right now. It's very difficult. Assuming the city will want to pursue that 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 strategy, which is obviously not the one we want. Can those uh, uh, those that, that tax payment be increased? Is it fixed? Is it allocated strictly for building? Can that be used for for working with in, in together with uh, with uh, land trust uh, developments, with the co-ops or or not for profits? Or is there, are there real restrictions to that, to, to that money? So that, that money that's collected cash in lieu of the city should choose that, that direction uh, for inclusionary zoning would go into a special account that could only be used to buy affordable housing. Uh, the city couldn't spend that money on something different, uh, on a road or a sewer or whatever. That money is collected under the inclusionary zoning bylaw for a very specific purpose. Um, if the city chose to do that. And like I said, that all depends on, on your councillors. We have two of them here. When this, this issue comes before council um, to debate, you know, you make sure you delegate and say that you kind of don't want that, that cash in lieu portion. You'd prefer to have the neighborhoods built where they are. Um, so I just, I, you know, just, I just wanted to kind of clarify that that is an option that, that is allowed by the legislation, but not one the city necessarily has to take. Thank you. All right, Elizabeth, I'll unmute you. Go ahead. Hi, I was talking to you before about the buildings that I've seen around Hamilton, like the buildings and houses that I've seen boarded up. I think they should be built in the affordable housing and be used for the people for affordable housing. Because I've seen them not being used and I think they should be used for affordable housing. Like they're just sitting there and not being used. Like I've seen them not being used and they're just sitting there like tons of buildings and houses like out in Dundas, Ancaster, all over the place where I've been. And they're just sitting there and not being used. Like they should be used for affordable housing. Like they could be used like they're nice houses and buildings and they're not being used for anything. And they're just sitting there. Thank you very much for, for, for mentioning that. Yes. Um, there, there, unfortunately there are some, there are limits to the extent at which a municipality can actually just put those units back on the market that are owned by private developers or land speculators who are just keeping the land off the market so that they can build on it once something like the LRT is complete and that land is worth more value to them. But one of the tools that uh, Councillor Nan mentioned is a vacant uh, home tax. So that is to say taxing the, the people who own that and making it prohibitive for them to keep those units off the market and just squat on them and speculate them. Thank you. All right, any more questions? We do recognize that it's eight o'clock and if you have to get going, that's all right. We're sticking around a little bit longer. All right, it seems like we don't have any more questions. So I'll pass it over to Anika to give our, to end up, end our meeting, yeah. Awesome, thank you Ishan for um, co-hosting this with me. It was uh, a lot of fun and I learned a lot and I just wanna express a sincere thanks to all of our guests, our friends and our allies who have helped organize this town hall. We hope that the evening has been both inspiring and informative. We hope that the town hall lays the groundwork for us to come together collectively to push for inclusionary zoning in Hamilton. Every resident is an integral part of our city. And we need housing built to reflect the needs of our community. The time is now to be bold and take action. Thank you again for joining us and have a great night.